Welcome back. I am super excited to introduce my guest. He's an actor, producer. He's got more acting credits than anyone I know. With 284 film and television credits on IMDb. Some of his films credits are with friends like these, The Light Ship, Total Recall, City Slickers, Die Hard 2, just to name a few. Some of his TV credits include Friends as Mr. Tribbiani, Joey's father, Family Ties, Barney Miller, Golden Girls, Murphy Brown, Rhoda, Alice, L.A. Law, Hill Street Blues, and many, many others. He was a series regular on Champions, The Last Resort, Charlie Grace. I mean, I could spend an hour just reading his resume. I want to welcome my friend, a great guy, a fellow Brooklyn Knight, Robert Costanzo. Bobby, welcome to the show. Right, right. Yeah, that's funny. Welcome, Billy. It's great to be. It's great to, you know, hook up with you again. And uh, yeah, we are both, uh, obviously, from, uh, you know, my wife always says I'm prejudiced, but we've got quite a few alums in all walks of life, don't we, in Brooklyn? <laughs> it's amazing. It's a, it's a rare breed, the Brooklynite. It really is. It, it really is. And, you know, when you go into the, uh, uh, what is it, the Brooklyn Bagel out here in L.A., you know, they have a lot of Brooklynites on the wall. And it's an amazing, you know, the Larry King, who just passed away, and uh, the great Jewish left-hander, Sandy Koufax, and Servino, and you know, and the, the list goes on and on. Oh, I'm forgetting, you know, I've said this before. I would argue that the three greatest comedic minds of maybe the last half century in cinema and TV and all are three Jewish guys from Brooklyn, Larry, uh, Larry David, but even more so Woody Allen and Mel Brooks. I mean, you know, it's, those are, that's, a, that's a tough triumvirate <laughs> for sure. Where, where'd you grow up? Where in Brooklyn? I haven't yet, Billy. Actually, <laughs> uh, no, I'm from uh, I'm from Sopranoville, <laughs> Bensonhurst. You where, know. where, where in Bensonhurst? I'm from uh, uh, to specifically Avenue T and West Eighth Street. Um, we used to kid around the Colombo Parish. I actually, <laughs> I went to Catholic school 16 years, and uh, right around uh, Bensonhurst, Gravesend uh, sounds kind of ominous, you know. Um, Gravesend, but uh, yeah, right, right there. That's actually where the Dutch settled a lot. But you know, it's a, an Italian conclave. Great place to grow up, and uh, you know, two family houses, and a lot of gals got married, lived upstairs from their mother, and you know, the blessed mothers in the front lawn, and just uh, yeah, because you're from where are you from? Bay Ridge. Well, know? I grew up in Sunset Park, but then my mother moved to uh, 75th and 18th Avenue, so you know, uh -huh. I went to New Utrecht. Right. So, so yeah, um, that's my old stomping ground, you know, 18th Avenue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, w I would have wound up actually going to Lafayette myself, but I wound up Catholic school all the way. St. St. Francis Prep, St. Francis College. Uh, my answering machine used to say, don't hang up. I have enough hang ups growing up in a Catholic religion. But, uh, <laughs> it was an altar boy the whole bit. You know? Hey, Lisa, you know, the, the podcast is called Hollywood Dream Maker Podcast. You know, when I created it, you know, you popped into my head. You were one of the first actors that popped into my head because, you know, you're, you're, you're a guy from the neighborhood and you really, like I said in the introduction, I mean, you've got 284 IMDb credits and I'm sure that's not all of them. I'm sure. Where are the yeah. residuals? Where the hell? Yeah, where's the residuals? <laughs> but, you know, it just amazes me, Bobby. You know, I mean, I remember, you know, seeing you, uh, you know, the first time I saw you was in Saturday Night Fever, you know, in, in the page. Which shop. was, you know, a little story there. Uh, I was just starting out because, uh, you know, I started in New York uh, in the 70s. And uh, most of my career, I've been based in California. But that was my, wasn't quite my first speaking job, but it was almost maybe first or second. But what happened was initially that was going to be a, a small movie with John Avelson, who was a very hot director, then directing the movie. And I was being considered for a really good role. And I had just started out, but they liked me. And as a matter of fact, I went to uh, a townhouse near Central Park and did improvisations with Travolta then. And I was evidently in the running when John Avelson had a big falling out and, you know, with Murdoch and Fox and they decided to make it a musical, and my character was just actually still in there, but he's a much older character. Sam Coppola played him, 
and I wound up doing, you know, the guy, which was uh, the kind of uh, sort of a, got, got got a lot of notoriety. The scene with John in the in the hardware store, which was shot in Brooklyn uh, under the L on eighty six. Yeah, yeah, I, know. I remember that story. And, and you know, that was almost a huge part. But I wound up doing that other guy, and uh, that's that was kind of my start in films because I was doing commercials and off Broadway stuff, et cetera. And then I got cast from a commercial that come to California. That's how that happened. I, I, I did an Alice, the show Alice, which was, a, you know, comedy with Vic Tayback. Would be sure. And, and I kind of never looked back. I went back to New York, you know, to shoot like the NYPD Blue and, and other movies here and there. But I was basically, even though I was known as a quote, New York actor, I was based mostly here. Well, let's go back to the very, very beginning. You know, where did the dream, you know, when did you know you wanted to be an actor? What, you know, yeah. what was that? You know, I mean, look, for me, for me, it was, I was 11 and they were filming a movie on my block in my neighborhood. They were filming Nunzio with David Proval, Jimmy Andronica. Wow. Now they really, really terrific movie and Proval's become a good friend. And what I love that movie. Yeah. So he was brilliant in that. I, he's actually been a guest on the show. And yeah, David's great. Yeah. They, you know, you know, they they set up base camp on my block. You know, they used there was a bungalow on my block that they used for all the interiors. They built sets. So Universal Studios was basically living on my block for a month. And yeah. as a little kid, you know, I came home. I was like, you know, I saw all the, you know, the trucks and all the stuff going on and i ran down the street i said what's going on they said we're making a movie i said how do you get in the movie long story short i, I got a little part in the movie as an extra you know i was okay. a background right but right. but what happened is when i showed up to the set there was an actor there was a lead actor young kid that looked just like me well he wasn't there that day so everybody thought i was him so they gave me the star treatment. They powdered my nose. They gave me the craft service, you know, everything. And I played along, you know, I played, the, yeah. you know, and, and, and then I just, I was so consumed by it that I was like following them from location to location yeah. and watching for Like it was like film school for me as a, as a young kid. And I got, that's when I truly got bit by the bug and I wanted to be an actor. But then there was a, a year later, they were filming Saturday night fever in my neighborhood. And they right. were doing a scene with the Barracuda Club when they crash through the, and they have this big fight yeah, and they, yeah, they yeah. do the stunt and whatever. And I stayed up to like four o'clock in the morning watching the stunt and all the stuff and with my sisters. And the next thing, you know, John Travolta is coming out of his honey wagon and, you know, gave me an autograph. And that's when I knew that I wanted to be an actor. Yeah. You know, so when did you know? Actor, by the way, you're a wonderful well, actor. And you know, Travolta. Uh, he that was the height. Uh, that's when he really became this, you know, iconic phenomenon. Before he had the big crash, and then of course came back again. But back then, in Brooklyn, we had a smuggle. When I say we, the with the Teamsters, though, we literally had to smuggle him out the back after we shot because the girls were like crazy. Yeah, it was madness. It was like Sinatra in the forties, you know. And uh, anyway, so that was a, that was a, a a pretty good start, and then. Uh, for me, so your original question, how did it start? Uh, I didn't actually have those dreams of being an actor back then. And uh, um, I think what happened was, I was always kind of the raconteur of the crowd. I would always, you know, go home with the papers and set my friends up with babes. And the next morning we would all tell stories and Bobby was the funny guy, you know, was Rodney Dangerfield used to say, the Italian guys always make it. You know, you know, Jews, we go home with uh, uh, bagels in the paper, you know. And I said, well, I'm a Jewish guy. I went home with the bagels of paper and made everyone laugh. So I was kind of funny in a raconteur. And I was in the textile business. I had a degree in business and was sort of floundering around. I go on a sales meeting and um, I, I go, I have a choice of either, and this actually leads up to how I really became an actor. I had a choice between hunting and golfing. I become, I'm a golf nut now. I have been for 20 years, but back then I said, let me go hunting. So I go hunting with one of these good old boys and we're going uh, quail hunting and I can't shoot worth the shit. I, I was blowing quail out of the air like the Annie Oakley. You Yankee boys can't shoot worth the shit, can you, Bobby? I go, shut up. I'm going to shoot you and put you in the back of my Cadillac. You're kidding around. But he was a, so at the end of the day, I shot six quail that were on the ground, not what you're supposed to do. So that night, they kind of gave me the Audubon Society Award, like a goof, you know, for killing birds. 
And I sort of topped everybody with my jokes. And I also wrote a little play about the executives in the company. P.S. I wind up coming home with Bob Levinson, the chairman of the board of the company, who says, you're very funny, Costanzo. Have you ever thought of show business? Something about this guy sitting in the back of his limo made me think, you know what? This could be a crossroads or something. Two days later, I find myself going to Lee Strasberg, the, the, the uh, Strasberg Institute in New York, you know, and the guy says, uh, you're a good type. And uh, what's- uh, Two oh. days later? After that, two days later- Two you days were... later, I just got this incentive. I'm on, I'm on the train and somebody had a booklet from the new school, Strasberg Institute. I literally got off like I was propelled from 42nd Street to 14th Street because the Strasberg Institute was on like 13th. Yeah. Got out. Yeah. The, the artistic director, uh, Mitchell Nestor, Leo remembers him, really, or Rossi, our friend. And Mitchell goes, you're a good type, $150. You start classes on Saturday. And I said, I blow that one day at Aqueduct. So <laughs> and then I was like transported into a new world, Billy. It was like, wow, look at these babes who would never look at me or say, would you like to come up to my loft and rehearse Antigone? You know, I go, fuck yeah, you know. <laughs> that started. And... Um, so I started doing, and I, a very funny story, the first scene I ever did, and I'm thinking of putting together a one-man show and putting some of this together, but this is all true. The first scene I ever did was there's a movie called uh, The Rainmaker, Burt Lancaster and uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn. She's, he's sort of a, a spinner of tales. His name is Starbuck, and, and she's like this spinster. So I did a scene with this actress, and uh, my first scene ever. So I'm in the bathroom at the Strasbourg Institute and I'm getting ready to get into my Burt Lancaster outfit, nervous as hell. And, and it's a small bathroom because it, it was limited facilities. There was no like dressing area. So whoever was in the stall there, I went, whoa, I don't know who's in there, but I know what to use for my next sharp smell sensory exercise. <laughs> From the method, we do all that. And out comes Strasbourg. Oh my God. In the bathroom. He goes, never mind the shop smell. You make sure you wash your hands. So now I'm a mess. <laughs> I go in to do this scene with this actress, who, by the way, was a foot taller than me. <laughs> you can believe it. Uh, you know, we say our inner objective as actors. My inner objective was to make her laugh. I rehearsed with her two weeks. Could you believe I could never make her laugh? And And a very sad footnote to this later on. I was doing championship season in Rhode Island. I heard it on the radio. She answered an ad and was killed and raped. It was terrible. This was about two years after I had done the scene with her. Anyway, I go, yes, yeah, terrible. Oh, God, her name was Karen Schlegel. She was meh, talented and God. Anyway, we go to do the scene. And in the scene, she takes off her, the pins out of her hair and Starbuck kisses her. So I go to kiss her. I miss her lips. It's a disaster. The class is laughing. And after, you know, the encounter with Strasbourg, so that was sort of my, you know, introduction into acting, but I persisted. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, I studied at Strasbourg, you know, that was where yeah, that, that's, that, that's what everything changed for me. I mean, you know, my, I think I mentioned my story to you, you know, I got bit by the uh, bug when I was, you know, 11, but you know, then, you know, uh, there was a there was a casting director. Gave, you start you you started at Strasburg. Who did you study with over there? I studied with Jeffrey Horn in the Young People's okay. Program, but I didn't study with him till I was, well, sixteen. What happened is is and and I, I think I've mentioned the story a long time ago, but you know I was running around the streets. You know I you know I came from a broken home and yeah. And, uh, you know, I was looking for, uh, you know, a, a father figure, I guess. And, you know, I was running around the neighborhood. You knew the neighborhood, you know, 18th yeah, Avenue, you yeah. know, wise guys, you know. And yeah. I I, uh, I hooked up with, with some guys that were, you know, you, uh, one of them was like Superman to me. You know, double-breasted suit, diamond pinky yeah. ring, handsome. All the girls loved him. All the guys feared him. Used to get me into clubs, pastels, changes. You know, I'd be hanging out in the... Uh, John Gotti was not even... J he was Johnny Boy hanging out in the VIP thing. You know, it wasn't even, you know, John Gotti back in the day. I'm, we're talking 1981, you know? Um, right. And, you know, he was, he was the guy, you know? He, as far as I was concerned, he said, do this do that, do that. I did whatever he said, you know, right, right, I was, I was, right. I was earning, you know, he, he was, uh, he was my idol. And, and then one day, uh, 
you know, I had cut out from school and, and I was walking down the street and I, I ran into him and he walked, uh, he said, come on, take a walk. And he walked into a, uh, a jewelry store uh, that he was shaking down and collected his, you know, collection. And then he started walking down and he walked to a men's clothing store in Brooklyn and um, he walked in and I stay, I was outside of the place and I watched him have a conversation with the guy behind the counter. And then he walked over to a suit rack, grabbed a bunch of suits, put them over his shoulder and started walking out the door. And as he was walking out the door, you know, I, he was my idol. My eyes were on him. I'm watching him. He's got this big cocky smile on his face. And from my peripheral vision, I see a guy come out from behind the counter and he pumps five bullets into him, you know, hitting him in the head. You know, one of the bullets went right over my head, uh, you know, and I watched him fold oh, out. Bro. And, and, and that was the guy I wanted to be, you know, and I watched him bleed out there and I knew that this was not the life for me. I had to get out of that whole life. And uh, then, you know, I had some guys, I, I had some guy looking to kill me in the street. So I, I went out and I hid out in Syracuse, New York, where my sisters were going to college. Long story short, I come back and um this guy's still looking for me so I, i'm at aqueduct i went a couple hundred dollars on the race and my friend said what are you going to do with the money i said i'm going to hollywood and everybody was like laughed that means told me yeah okay yeah right whatever and um you know i went out to b b before that i i i was studying i ran into a guy that lived across the street from me that was studying at lee strasberg and i begged him to take me to new york and, yeah, there, uh, yeah, you're talking about the Institute. Uh, yeah, yeah, 40, yeah, 14th it Street. Of, it was part of the new school. That's where it was. Yeah, saying. so, so I, studied, I studied at Lee, at Lee Strasberg, and then, you know, then I went to, uh, hit that race, and then I came out to Hollywood. But, you know, when I told you this story, you know, this, I've mentioned this story before, and, you know, it sounds like make-believe, right? You know, it sounds like something out of a movie, right? But, but it's an amazing you know, story, but you know what? A lot of that stuff shaped, you know, who you are and all, you know, it, it, it sort of framed, you know, your life experiences and you distilled them and used them. And, you know, you're, you know, I, I still remember some of the scenes you did when we did, we, you know, I don't know if the people know, we, I guess we met each other through our friend Bobby Moresco, who's gone on to, you know, write Crash and be had an incredible career. I think you've had him on your show. And, uh, you know, I remember you doing some of the scenes there and uh, the actor's gym, which Bobby kind of started out here. And I was kind of his unofficial uh, artistic consigliere, if you will. And, you know, so many of us became great friends and it's still an ongoing thing. And yeah. Yeah, I think you saw me in Extremities there. Yeah, you were amazing, you know. And uh, and by the way, you, the magician stuff is still. You know. <laughs> you know, everybody mentions that the magic, and people don't know that I'm. When did you When did you develop that skill? I mean, you were like hell bent to be an actor since you were a little boy, I guess. Yeah. So you know, I mean, it goes back to when I was a kid. You know, what happened was there was. I was at school, you know how they have those little elastic clips and you have your gloves, it has a little clip to clip yeah, your yeah, gloves yeah, so that yeah, you don't yeah. lose your gloves, they hang like this. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. I lost one of my gloves. So, yeah. you know, I had this piece of elastic with this little clip thing and I clipped a quarter to it and I, and I stretched it out and I, and, I sh and I shot up my arm. And so I, I went to all the girls at school, I said, look at the quarter and then boom, it disappeared. <laughs> all of a sudden I got a response and like the girls were like, oh my gosh, you show her, show her. And then I was like, wait, there's something here, <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> And that's when I kind of got, you know, bit by the magic bug and uh, as a kid. But, you know, then as a... As it's a, all about the girls. Once we can make the girls laugh and... Oh, oh, us, forget no about it. Is, that's it. Well, that's why I went to Lee Strasberg. I was in a, the Young People's Program. I was When I had Jeffrey Horn on the show, you know, I was in a class with like 22 actresses. I was the only actor in the class that it was amazing. I was everybody's scene part. <laughs> so... <laughs> So really motivated. I was highly motivated to get the class on Saturdays. Right, right. But you know, when, as a, when I came out to Hollywood, you know, I knew I needed to make some money. I, I needed to have like a, a way to get some to make some money. So I so really. You were about I, 18, 19 when you came out. Of it. Yeah, I came out at, when I was eighteen. I hit Hollywood in, at eighteen years old, but I didn't want to do the waiter thing. I mean, I did a you know, when I first came out. I, did, I had a little busboy job, but then I was yeah. like, I needed. I need to figure out a way to make money. And, you know, I used the magic. I mean, I was doing, you know, street magic, going to bars, restaurants, you know, clubs, walking around, yeah. putting on my tuxedo on, you know, playing the role of the magician. And, and I, I made a pretty decent living. I mean, I could go out and go out and make a few hundred bucks in you, cash. You're what, they, you're what they call a close-up magician. No yeah. Magician, not like Siegfried and Roy. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I left. I didn't have the lions, but you know, I, I did. You know, I did have bird. You know, I had birds, doves that I would produce. <laughs> you know, in the middle of a restaurant, I pull out a bird. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was an amazing uh, magician. A couple of guys I worked with, you probably well, Milton Burrow, who was Mister Television. I did Guys and Dolls with Milton, and he would the mm-hmm. stuff he could do close up was amazing. And he was Johnny Carson guy. too. Yeah, and did you know Tony Giorgio? Yeah, sure. He's amazing Tony, with Tony, cards. Tony, Tony and I did uh, uh, Guys and Dolls together. I played Harry the Horse with Milton, and, and Tony was Big Julie. It was unreal. He was an amazing. Yeah. He, I used to head me to the, uh, to the Magic Castle. That's where of- I saw him. I saw him up at the Magic yeah. Castle. I used to, that was my home away from home. You know, I was living yeah, up there. Yeah. yeah. That's, Tony that's, was the that's awesome. Guy. I passed away about eight nine years ago from cancer you know it's, yeah wow. he played uh, uh he was in the godfather he played yeah, he stuck the ice pick and yeah remember yeah, the bartender he had that face he was he could terrify you good good guy yeah yeah so anyway yeah so i came out here so i was like working in new york and studying and then i studied mira rostova who was a big influence on me and then uh i came out here, i got cast from a commercial uh, to do an Alice, you know, it was weird. It was just like somebody. How old were you? At that time, I was in my early thirties. Wow! It. So you didn't, you didn't really. I, I mean, when did you start? At, when did you? Yeah. How old were you when you started acting? Uh, twenty nine or thirty. When I when I went to Strasbourg, when I took that class. And, wow. And, well, yeah. So I was not. You know, I had. I had. Uh, I, I graduated St. Francis College. You know, I did the whole high school college right by the numbers and early 20s and wound up uh, in mostly in textiles and sales and uh, you know hanging out it was never something I loved I was passionate about you know I'd use the uh, company car to go to the racetrack and whatever and I made a living and uh, then I got engaged fell in love we fell out of love and whatever and then the next thing you know I don't know I had this thing with Bob Levinson the chairman of the board and all of a sudden I went boom and I went over to Strasbourg it's weird how stuff you know, it's like you crossroads in life and you take the path or you don't. And, uh, you know, you say to yourself, would I become an actor? Uh, 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 if not for that, maybe. Who knows? You know, you, you, you never really know. I remember I was offered a, a job when I was in textiles in Chicago. It was pretty considered a, a, a definite, you know, promotion and more money. But I was engaged to Dorothy from Brooklyn, who I met at Pastels, one of the <sighs> penthouse. And I didn't want to leave. I wanted to be around her. And who knows? If I go to Chicago and make a lot of money for Duplan, maybe I wind up being, you know, one of those guys in the in the in the training program and living in Chicago. Who you never know. Life goes takes strange byways and highways. Weird. So, Bobby, I don't know if you remember this, but we, you know, we didn't meet with uh, with Bobby Moresco. Oh, we, no, met, we, we, we did a film together in 1988 called Crossing the Mob with Jason oh, Bateman and that, Mortini. That's right. That's and right. You chased me with the bait. The scene was is I rob an old lady's purse because Frank oh, Stallone was right. playing the local that's wise right. guy, boss, mafia boss. And that Jason Bateman's trying to impress him. So me, right. me and his crew come up with this scheme that we're going to rob this old lady's purse, like his grandmother, or whatever his purse. And then, uh, you know, he's going to return the person. He's, he's going to be the hero. And then he's going to get a job yeah, yeah, working yeah. for this mob yeah. guy. So the scene was, is I go and I, I put, I have a ski mask on. I come and running by and I snatch the purse. And then you, you came running after me with a baseball bat. You chased me like three blocks yes. <laughs> down alleys. And I, and then I, they had it set up where there was a trash dumpster. I jump in the dumpster. They close the door, you know, yes. you're looking and they point you down the, and you keep running and, <laughs> I almost die. I almost get killed with a baseball bat. <laughs> oh my God. That's right. My friend wrote that. My friend Lou Cohen wrote that. And Louie wound up, uh, we're still good friends. We play poker together. And uh, he's written uh, Ghosts of Mississippi and uh, October Sky. And he's, he's quite an accomplished wow. good pal. I'm going to tell him about that again because we, we, we have a Zoom meeting of all our ex poker guys who can't play poker now because of the pandemic yeah well you know there is poker online there is the you know <laughs> no but i'm not that's not my thing you know i'm not uh... yeah but you can play you can look at each other too via zoom so you can play yeah. and then look at each other. have you done it have you done i it? have I, I played in a tournament i came in second place 
Yeah, I've, oh. I, I've played in tournaments. I love I love uh, holding poker, but uh, I have not played it online anyway. But uh, that's right, crossing the mob. Right. Wow. Hey. So so, Bobby. You know, I I know. Do you remember Andy Dillon? He's a friend of mine. He was a stuntman. I remember. I'm I'm not sure, but I think he told I know, me. You know what? Oh wow! I haven't seen Andy Andy in years. Yeah. And I think he was a student of yours. It, it, yeah, that's right. I've uh, yeah, I used to I used to coach privately here and there, and even now, uh, before again before the scourge and all, I, I was uh, occasionally going out to John Ruskin School in Santa Monica and Steve Snyder's workshop, which he Leo Rossi was connected with at one time. So I've done a little teaching. So so yeah. I'd love to talk to you about you know what's your approach? You know, I mean, you study. Yeah. With- you know, uh, Montgomery Cliffs and Armand DeSante and Alec Baldwin and Jessica Lang's teacher. You know, what did, what, what, what did you get from that? Uh, well, Mira, okay, there were widely different approaches. So at Strasbourg, you know, uh, I never completely bought into the method. I, I think it worked. You know, the, it, it's a funny thing, the method. It's almost like uh, no one can really exactly define it. I remember Harvey Keitel. Now, Harvey's a brilliant actor. And uh, I'm not meaning to make fun of him, but uh, he was talking about the method, and it was uh, it, it was almost like a spoof on, uh, on Saturday Night Live spoof because he was going uh, the method. You see, uh, what is the method? You want to know? Well, uh, it's a uh, it's it's a process. It's a it's a way of defining. You see, it's a. Uh, People don't understand it at all. I go, yeah, unlike you, Harvey, <laughs> it, but but in all defense of Harvey. I mean, the, the method, as you know, is, you know, using a lot of past life experiences. I, yeah, I think it was codified by Strasbourg, who, you know, brought it here from Vaktingov and, and, and from Russia. And uh, <laughs> there's some funny stories about it. I remember hearing when Stella Adler came here from Russia and she was the grand dame and she's coming off the boat and all the students are rushing to meet her and she's screaming loudly. And they finally, as they get closer, they hear her saying, we're, it's wrong. We're doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong. <laughs> and you know the method, but you know, obviously, I think anybody, any creative person, you know, uses their imagination, life experiences, parallel experiences. I go a lot to people. I go to guys I know because I tend to play, you know, guys from my background in the neighborhood. And there were a lot of colorful guys, as you know, growing up. And I often. Uh, I often like sort of uh, inhabit their whole psyche and it comes out, you know, the rhythm of their voice. You know, I do use uh, affective memory is a, is a strong thing with me, um, smells sometimes. So in a sense, I do use the method. What Mira Rostova worked on though, she was almost anti-method. She was all about the imagination and the script. And uh, a lot of people have mocked her because she had five key words she used. It was, uh, she would talk about uh, simple things like uh, if you had a, a line, a simple line, like it's raining outside and how the conditions of the scene would change that. You know, if you were uh, a weatherman and your job, you know, was important that you were right, you go, it's raining outside, you're happy. You know, if you're gonna go on a picnic with your girlfriend and it's raining outside, so simple, but. You know, she would call them the I, with that five words lament. Um, uh, <laughs> what are they now? <laughs> uh, to lament, to admit, and uh, and to uh, uh, she codified them. It's funny, I can't quite recall them now. But I, I used to kid around with Armand Asante, and I would imitate Mira because she was this sort of little bird-like Russian woman who would sit there. And legend that rumor has it, like she would be on the set of From Here to Eternity, and Monty Cliff would do a big scene and look her way, and she would either go, or <laughs> like you know, like a don, like a mob don. And if she went like this, Fred Zinnemann would go nuts because he had to redo the whole scene. Wow. Anyway, but I liked her because I hooked into her. She made sense to me. Um, and it's very helpful out here because, you know, a lot, a lot of actors, it's like, uh, oh, I, I can't go, I can't get there. I need time, you know, in a way, bullshit, because look, if I give a musician a piece, he puts it in his horn, he plays it, he may not play it as well as he does opening night at Lincoln Center, but he can play it. There's this mystique and this thing about, 
oh, you know, I can't, you know, I can't do it. I need time. I need, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to work much out in Hollywood. You know that, you know, in the morning you get, you know, sometimes you got an hour or two to prepare a script and, and, you know, you're a construction worker in the afternoon, you're a state senator and, you know, you got to facile and, and that's why, uh, you know, that's, that's been my thing. Having said that, uh, you know, I'm not certainly not anti-method and I know a lot of actors seem to need that time to get into it. You know, I remember working with an actress who had all these copious notes next to her, you know, her, her lines and, you know, what I did this morning, my favorite color, what's my astrological sign? Who needs that? <laughs> I was I was just reading the other day about I think it was on on the internet Denzel Washington who's like one of my favorite actors I love this guy I mean he's yeah. he's got the whole package and he's working with I'm not telling tales out of school he was on the uh, on the internet he was working with Jared Leno who's driving him crazy because he's he's you know all the preparation and you know and of course that that's not going to work with Denzel you know he just like. You got to you got to be there and you got to get to it. We, we can't wait two hours for you to have a moment. You know, yeah. well, I saw that film. I saw Jared Leno's performance oh, you did. really good. Yeah. Uh, you know, but he, he is good. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, maybe his, it was worth maybe that extra, you know, because well, you know what? Yeah. You know what? Look, you know what? If look, Pacino's, you know, one of the you know champions of the method, you know, uh, uh, some people, if you can get to those levels, but you, you know, you, you got to You can't. You can't just, uh, you know, sort of uh, drag your feet forever. You've got to sure. do it. You know, I remember when I first started studying at Strasbourg, there were some people who did great exercise, but they weren't very good actors. You know, they could, but they would, they would feel the sun go from 70 degrees to 85. And, <laughs> ah, 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 ah. you know, oh, that's beautiful. You know, there was a kid, <clears throat> little small guy, he was, it was amazing. He could do. He could. He could feel. He, he could feel rain. He could. He could. You know, see his grandmother and do all this stuff. And wasn't very good when he acted. When I came out here, I would correspond to him before the email days and write these long letters. And I'm like almost seeking his approval on things. And then I go, What am I doing? This kid's like tending, you know, bar or waiting tables. I'm out here making a living, and I'm, you know. So I stopped writing. <laughs> she would be critical of my shit. Well, you were pretty good in that Barney Miller, but you know, you could have on gold. <laughs> you know, I believe, you know, actors should study them all, study, you know, everything, yeah. and then create your own method, you know, figure out what works for you. You know, build your actor toolbox. No, how do I get to that place? Yeah. You know, what yeah. is it? What is it? What is my triggers? What do I have? You know, if I, yeah. if I have to go to that emotional place, where's my truth? Yeah. You know, don't yeah. act, you know, take your truth, your soul and hand it over to the character, you know, and make some big choices. Let's talk about, you know, auditioning. You know, you yeah. mentioned, you know, nerves in the bathroom, at least Strasbourg and stuff like that. How do, have you had to deal with nerves and, and nervousness or as an actor or auditioning or any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, I, I think when a when a scene is uh, sort of a little bit out of my belly work, you're a little nervous. I mean, one that comes to mind is I read for a uh, for, uh, I forget which Shakespearean play it was, but I was awful because I was nervous about it. I'm reading for Tony Richardson, who's a, the great English director, and I was a mess. And, you know, that, that was a lesson well served. I said, you know, you've got to, but the good thing about doing that is the next time I go in for something that's a little bit out of my belly, a little out of my range, I think I'd, I'd be more comfortable because I've been through the, you know, the, the, the nerves of it and all. But, uh, Generally, um, and I would tell that to actors, you know, don't don't do what I do because I have my own way. You know, well, you know, nowadays, unfortunately, we're either self-taping or even before the pandemic. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, people putting yourself on tape, even if you're a fairly accomplished actor, and then they send it in. And I, I hate that. I like I like the producers in the room myself because I think they feel who I am a lot Shh. Wait, you know absolutely i mean you know for me you know you're you're a great guy i mean you, you know your personality people like you they want to be around you you know when they meet you they're going to want to work with you so i think it's really important you know the the that relationship thing you know it's it's yeah. to be able to meet somebody in person and th th then get a sense of who you are uh, is is going to be completely different yeah than because i mean yeah 
Yeah, I mean, like when we were doing with friends like these, where I got to play the lead that Penny Marshall produced, and I was in on some of, I was in on all the auditions for the most part. And you know, it's fun to be on the other side and look at it, and then you really get a sense of of, of people, of actors, and sure. about, and you say to yourself, I think I'd like that guy or that gal on my set. I think they would be. You know, I, I could I could feel even if they don't hit every note and some other actor maybe hits it a little better here and there. But, you know, there's an intangible sometimes that you, you get. It's it's a crapshoot sometimes. You know, it, it is. Uh, and, and like I said, I told actors, you know, I have my own way of kidding around and trying to disarm people and, you know, saying stuff that's like, you know, depending on on the project. Uh, I, I, I literally have said things like, uh, listen, I know you got time to think about this. You're not going to find anybody better, but uh, I'm sure over the weekend you'll think it over. You'll fuck it up, and you'll hire Jan Michael Vincent for, you know, to play, <laughs> a, to play an Italian mob boss or something. You know, and, and sometimes that works. You know, and uh, I remember one time I read for a, a project uh, for Jim Brooks and those talented writers and all. There was a, a short live series. And uh, they wound up going with, um, it was for a tennis pro, and they wound up going with a, a great actor, William Devane, but I really thought this guy was me. And I read it, I'll never forget, I just, you, you, you know, you read something, you sure. know, and I literally flip the script up in the air and I go, that's as good as it gets. Now go hire, um, I don't know, John Stamos or Jim, you know, somebody who's completely different than me. <laughs> of course, they built, they, you know, it, sometimes you grist for the mill. They, they know they want Bill Devane was a name and, you know, they're just killing time in case they can't make a deal and all that stuff. But, you know, that's. So when you get, you know, the business has changed drastically from yeah. when, when, you know, I mean, we've been, I've been in the business, you know, I came out here in 84. So, I mean, when did, when did you come out here? I came out in 77. Okay, so 77. So, you know, you've been in the game for, for a long time. And, and, you know, back in 77 and even 84, you know, it was a different time. You know, we were like, you know, with our black and white headshots, with our resumes. Yeah, you know, and, 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 you know, I, I'm still not, I, and I, you know, I, I kick myself in the ass sometimes. And it's not out of being an ego, like, oh, they should know who I am. But, I, you know, I'm not proactive enough with the whole uh uh, you know, internet and getting yourself online and, you know, getting your reel back up to speed, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So uh, you kind of got to do that now, you know? Yeah, you have to. Have to. Joe, Mon Joe Montagna, I said, Joe, I don't know if I could make it these days as an actor. Who knows? You know, it's a world. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's just... Uh, Listen. And, and sometimes, you know, it's my good fortune sort of to be who I am and the way I look. And sometimes it's my... Uh, it, it's the sort of bane of my existence because I always feel like there's a lot more I could have done, should have done, would have done, might have done. But, you know, you you get your niche and it's there's a lot of talented people and I'm happy to have that niche, although that niche is going away. As you get older and all, it's, they forget about you sometimes. Yeah, but, you know, that's why, you know, you, you need to get, you get all that digital stuff out there. You got to have yeah. your demo reel yeah. out there because there are a yeah. lot of young casting directors that, you know, they weren't, they, they weren't even born. <laughs> they don't have no idea who you are, you know, right. but you got to have that where they can click on and go, Oh yeah. Now I remember, I see yeah. it. It's right there in front of their face, you know? So know. it's really important. I mean, you know, back in the day, you know, when I came out here, I remember when I was looking for an agent, you know, there was, I got a list of agents from the Screen Actors Guild and literally had, a, I had one of those Thomas guides, you know, with a book yeah. with A4 to find out, you know, walk in the streets, yeah. having to go to a pay phone, put a quarter in it, make a call to. So, I mean, now, you know, actors have it easy. They have this, you know, this little device in their pocket that gives yeah. them everything they need. You know, it's a movie making machine. It's a it's you can write a script on it. You can edit it. You can yeah. I mean, you can do everything on it. And it's really important that that thing know, it has changed everything. Look at even in scripts and the way you develop scripts, how you can use the device of the, you know, you don't have to go to the phone booth then where you flip it out of your pocket and you're online. And, you know, the, the cell phone has become a big part of the. Sure. I mean, you could dictate to your phone. become part of the inner workings of scripts and all that. Sure. It's, it's, it's amazing. It changes. But uh, what do you see the future of Hollywood? Ah, good question. The future of Hollywood. I hope it doesn't get to that point where, you know, there's always, there's been that talk about they could sort of uh, CGI, you know, anybody and, and you could, uh, 
you could create a face so you, <laughs> you don't have to pay Tom Cruise twenty million dollars. You think that'll happen, or is I mean, look what they did with uh, the Irishman. Yeah. I yeah. mean, they, they they made De Niro, you know, young. <laughs> they, yeah, they made him younger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Pacino, they made him. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of scary think, what they can do. Yeah, I think they're still going to want though actors and people who can bring it. I I don't think that'll change. But uh, you know uh, how they package movies, the whole streaming world. You know, here's the other thing. I was talking to you know Leo Rossi, you had on the show. We were talking this morning. What's going to happen when this thing finally ends and? Uh, we can go like movies. Well, I just had a whole thing in, in the paper this morning, the Golden Globes, how it's become a television world with all the writers and most of your good projects. And But hopefully when this thing ends, if any of these movie theaters are still in business, you would think people are going to flock to concerts, movies, and restaurants all over again, I hope. Otherwise, I, I don't know. I'm really not sure what the future will be, but certainly streaming and and how we get compensated for all that that's all i don't know it's um what do you what do you think i mean what's you what's i think i th yeah, i think once the theaters open up and all that stuff i think people are still going to be scared it's going to be trickling in you know it's going to yeah. be a slow process it's not going to be like they're going to open up the gates and everybody's going to run in you know um i do believe that you know the future of casting will remain self tapes and self tape you know uh zoom calls you know because why you know if i'm a if i'm a director why do i want to drive to hollywood in traffic you know and instead of staying in my malibu beach house if i can just watch a bunch of tape of actors and choose right there and then if i wanted to do a callback just meet with them on zoom you know so it's it, it's made it easier. I think that they, now they've gotten accustomed to it. I think that might stick around, you know, from, from what I'm hearing that, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna yeah. stick, you know, it's I, those walking into the room may not happen. I mean, maybe, maybe on a final callback, if they want to just kind of see you in a personality thing, but I think a lot of them are going to be self tapes. And that's why I tell my actors right now that this is the time to become a master at self taping, really figure it out. You know, your lighting, your framing, your everything, you know, so yeah, that you stand out, you got to stand out like a sore thumb. It's, you know, if, if I'm a casting director and I'm looking at 700, you know, self tape submissions for one role, you know, and it's the guy with the wrinkle curtain and the script in his hand, you know, and just saying the words. And then there's a guy who, you know, is in the wardrobe of the character. The background is, let's say you're playing a detective and you're interrogating the guy, you know, you don't want to be with the, the blue background, you know, put yourself against a gray wall that looks like maybe a, an inter interrogation room, something real, you know, frame it up right here. So it's, you know, it looks like a close up. Good point. Mostly what I've been doing is uh, I've, on a few self tapes I have, I use a fairly uh, plain wall. And um, and I and I, I I bought this gizmo for about forty bucks where you put your cell phone and lock it in, okay, so that it it's it's like a tripod, basically. Sure. Well, like, like a ring light. But I'm I'm sure it's not you know first class uh, uh, editing lighting, etc. It looks okay to me, but I'm sure there are guys who you know have uh, even with voiceovers, which I've done a lot of. My voiceover stuff, I do. Yeah, so so you're you're the voice you're the voice uh, of Harvey Bullock and Batman, right? You've done uh, Family yeah, Guy, do. Rugrats, Hercules. Yeah, yeah, I did I did Philatides, which Danny did, Devito, he did the movie, and then uh, some of the movie people continued to do the series. Most did, and I I wound up doing Dan, Danny's role, uh, and I've done Bullock, who's been a great. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're having a a Zoom. Uh, uh, sort of reunion uh, in a couple of weeks with the cast and, you know, that kind of thing. And people, you know, will wind up selling whatever sells and signing stuff. That's fun. Uh, yeah. Then, and I, that became, uh, I've been doing that about 25 or 30 years. I sort I of fell into that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. So if I'm a, I'm a young actor and I'm thinking of doing some voiceover work, what would your advice be to me? Yeah, I think the best thing to do is try to put a tape together. You know, that voiceover world, though, as far as uh, even, well, not so much cartoons, but from what I understand, like, in, and I used to do a lot of uh, uh, TV and radio spots, and they can be lucrative uh, for uh, products. Uh, but a lot of that has gone non-union these days, from what my agents tell me, and I know to be true to some degree. But as far as putting, I, I would say put a tape together, no know who you are. If you've got a quirky off the wall voice, then I would say do some, 
you know, find some copy you can get it out of magazines and all, and, and put that together and try and get it over to a to a, an agency. And uh, and if not, if you have a you know really solid sort of you know uh, kind of uh, anchor newsman voice, then you know highlight that because uh, there's a group of I mean I've done okay with cartoons. There's a group of actors. One of them, uh, Kevin Richardson, who was a uh, wonderful guy, he's an African American guy, huge, and his, his range of voices is incredible. I've worked with this guy. I mean, he can do little kids, and he can do, uh, uh, you know, uh, like deep voiced baritone, you know, impressive characters, amazing. There's a few of them that really have cornered that market. They do a lot of those Saturday morning cartoons. So if you have that kind of voice, and I don't know. I'm with uh, Sutton Bob Veneri. They, they're good across the board, but uh, you know, I think certain agencies, like like everything else, are stronger in some areas than others. But I'd say put a good tape together in all. Yeah. So, so what would your advice be to actors if some you know young actor wants to get into business? I mean, you know, it's funny as I have actors that you know that are teenagers and you know they're saying, oh, I feel like I'm I'm just get, I'm getting into the business late in the game, you know, and then then. I mean, you, you got into Look at me. I was 30 years old, 30 really. Years old. When I say started, I mean, I was just starting it. So by the time I got some momentum, I was a couple of years in New York doing my commercials. And, and literally, oh, like, it, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody who's got more credits than you. When I saw you, IMDb. I guess so. I, it's, it's, I didn't realize it was that many. That, that, is a lot, that is a lot of credits, you know. And, and, and truthfully, Billy, I even... Nowadays, like you say, be more, uh, I, I've never been that proactive. I've never been that driven, to be honest. I mean, I, I kind of wish I were, I think I've done okay. But, but, you know, I, I used to look at some guys and say, look how lucky I am because they'd be there every morning, you know, scouring at that time backstage and variety and, and sending out their, their resume with pictures. This is even before the, the whole internet age and and they, nothing would happen and i guess you know uh luck some talent you fall in you get a niche and you keep going and uh, but you know i'm more unusual i think you know mostly you've got to be a little more driven and a little more uh, orderly and you know programmed on how to do it uh you know have you have to be you have to now this day and age you know there it's it, there's so many actors and you know, you're competing with, you know, your, yeah. your, your thumbnail is this, you know, an inch on a, on a computer screen, you know, they don't have that headshot. So it's, you know, you really have to outwork, out prep, out choice, out ever. You got to be hungry. You got to yeah. be relentless in your pursuit of this. This is not something you go in and you get 50%. This is something yeah. you got to go after like you friggin' mean it. My, my youngest son, Chris, who is, I think, talented, not just because he's my son, but, you know, he's, he's got, he wants to do stand up, he wants to do acting, but he doesn't really focus on any of it. So, you know, it's, I, I hate to say, it, but I don't think he's going to ever really develop for him because I told him, Chris, you literally got to eat, sleep and drink it. You've got to be in the arena all the time. You know, you're better off being a production assistant than, you know, being a bartender in a way. I mean, because you're in the arena, things happen. People like you, they pick up on stuff and, and you know, you know, I, I saw this gal the other day at the, where was it? Smart and final. She's buying giant bags of popcorn. And I said, what are you opening a movie theater? She goes, we're doing a shoot. And she recognized me. We started talking. And I said, look, what you're doing is great. I said, it's just, you're, you're there, you're working, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're in the arena. Things can happen. And, you know, that's important. Sure. It's all, you know, there's no. Students that, you, you have a lot of uh, young students, right? Or I, I have them at every age, you know, I have, every, I have, is that your th that's your theater, right? This there. is my, yeah, this is my theater. I opened up that's my school space. Wow. Yeah. Built it with these two hands, you know, seven years ago. It's been, it's been the, my greatest. And you, you, where is that? Manhattan beach. It's in Manhattan beach. Yeah. Wow. You know, what's, what's that's beautiful great. is though, you know, I mean, look, the, the, since the pandemic, you know, my doors have been closed, you know, sure. since it started. Sure. So you know, it, it forced me, you know, this COVID has forced me to get outside of the South Bay, you know, and really take everything I teach online. That's why I created this podcast so I can go global and I can reach other people. And now it doesn't matter what's where you are, what state, what country or whatever, you know, you can study with me via Zoom. 
you know, so it's it's actually been a, a great. When, when do you when do you hold your classes? I have classes. My my master class is Monday nights from seven thirty to eleven. I have a teen class that starts you know in, in an hour. Um, you know, I have I do mostly privates. You know, you know what I do here is is I, I guide. You know, I've been there. I've done that. I got the T-shirt to prove it. You know, um, I found my true passion, which is really you know creating dreams if if you have a passion for this if this is truly your passion and you have a dream for it and don't know how to get started and don't know what to do well i do i've been there and you know i create actors all the time they knock on my door with a dream and i make it a reality i mean if i had a nickel for every time what's your approach when you when you teach i mean obviously it's different with the master classes at the beginning but what is your are you method or what do you what is your approach my approach to the craft is is don't act you know, I don't teach acting. I teach truth. You know, how mm -hmm. do you take your stuff? You know, everything that's ever happened to you in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all that stuff. That's your gold as an actor. You know, that's what makes you unique. You know, so I, I really focus on, you know, what's your star power? Who are you? Like, what is your stuff? What are you offering to Hollywood? You're a, you're a product. You got to know what you're selling. You know, I knew what I was selling when I came out here. I was this Brooklyn kid from the streets. You know, I, I, I sold that to Hollywood and they bought it, you know, and they That's gave me kind of what I sold. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, but I knew, you know, when somebody said, you got to get rid of the axe. And I was like, fuck that. I said, That's what makes me different, you know? Yeah. And, you know, when yeah. I got my TV series, they were looking for a surfer dude from Venice Beach with a parrot on his shoulder, you know? And I was like, uh, No, I see him kind of, you know, I grew up watching the Fonz and Harry Winkler with the leather jacket. So I gave him the leather jacket with the wife beat it with the gold chain. Yeah, because, the you know, you, you, yeah, you wouldn't get, you, you're not going to get that. That, that other guy anyway. So, yeah, so I, I changed their mind. I changed their mind. They, I brought the character into the room and I showed them who the character was. So, you know, that's what I teach is, is you know, you got to use your star power. What's what makes you unique? And then really don't act really. How do you make it truthful? How do you substitute? How do you personalize? How do you put yourself well, in a real place? Yeah. How about if somebody, right, how do you put, right. How about if somebody's going sort of far afield, if you're like reading for a, uh, a 17th century count from Russia. I mean, what, what is a, a, a kid from Bensonhurst? Uh, how do you make that move without, well, without you got to drop some of the accent, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Listen, I've, I've played, I've played many, many characters where I had to lose the accent, you know, yeah. but, I, but the accent got me in the door. The, yeah. the accent I found that, you know, when it, when I did like my TV show, I could make lines funnier. You know, you too. You know, show? what show did you do? With I did a series called Boys Will Be Boys with Matthew Perry. It was me and him. It was me. Yeah. Originally, it was called uh, Second Chance. Randy Heller was on the show. Uh, right. Kiel Martin was on it, and then they canceled it and revamped it and became Boys Will Be Boys. But you know that I found that like like with Who's the Boss? You know, I found that if I laid the accent on a little thicker and I made him a little dumber and I made him a little this and that, the, yeah. the, the lines got funnier. When they, I could get I actually, him left. Yeah, I, I think I did the first Who's the Boss. Did you? I did the first one. I played, oh, it was funny. You got, but get yeah, anyway. Yeah, but you know, so I mean, that's what got my foot in the door. But you know, of yeah. course, if you're going to play that kind of character, you have to do the research, you have to find the accent, sure. you have to, you have to, you know, you got to, but, but what I'm saying, let's say you're, you're doing it. And the, the scene is, you know, you have an argument with your father in the thing. Well, you don't know this, this, this fictional character of the father, right? You have to be able to put somebody in there real, somebody, a father figure, a real father, somebody truthful. So you're not acting with an imaginary land. You're right. working with the truth. Well, that, that, that goes around back to the method, because in a sense, yeah, we all, we all use life experiences. We use, you know, uh, powerful memories and things to to trigger emotional things. So, I mean, clearly that is the way to go. I mean, uh you know, Olivier, and again, you know, when with when, when rapid equipment, but Olivier, for instance, uh, he would say, but you see, I think a lot of this is the mystique of actors, and it's not completely true, but Olivier would say uh, he would be uh, thinking of his laundry list right before he was going to do some impassioned solilo soliloquy. Uh, Tony, uh, I remember reading in a, in a book of, uh, I think it was Larry King wrote about some, some of his uh, interviews and all that. Uh, Quinn was working with uh, Olivier on Broadway, and Olivier was about, it was, they were doing Beckett, I think, and he had this big, incredibly impassioned speech, and all of a sudden, Quinn feels this tugging on, on, on his, uh, on his tunic, his robe, and it's Olivier, and he, they're upstage at this point, 
focuses downstage more, but Olivier goes, Tony, where, where can one get a, a, a really good ale in town here? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned right before he's got to do this thing. So, you know, uh, and, and uh, to be honest, I mean, some of these, you know, watching some of the, the shows, some of these British actors are marvelous. I think we tend to say they're all external and not and whatever, but whatever they're doing, it's uh, it's mostly feels very connected and, and, and real. A lot of them are very powerful. Listen, I, I, I consider myself a method actor, you know, I mean, yeah, listen, me I played, too, a, I think I am too, I think. Uh, listen, yeah. I played a paraplegic once, you know, on uh, an episode of China beach and you know, well, I, I, what did I do? Well, I, I, I strapped my legs up so I couldn't use them. Yeah. I dragged myself around my house to go to the toilet, yeah. to go to the yeah. kitchen, everything yeah. to drag myself in bed because I wanted to feel what it feels like to not have any legs. How do you play a paraplegic unless you, you know, you have actually you know, no, you yeah. got to have some really yeah. strong upper body strength yeah. to be able to lift yeah. yourself up without the use of your legs to go brush. Yeah, your and, yeah. tricks look uh, Hoffman uh, when he when he, you know, did that walk in uh, I cowboy, he would he would have uh, like pebbles in, in <laughs> his feet and his shoes and gave him that, you know, why not? And that's the famous story where Olivier said when he when he looked, well, I don't know if you heard that story where he was completely disheveled when they were doing Marathon Man. Uh huh. He idolized Olivier and and he, he came to work Monday morning. He looked over. He said, My dear boy, what, what's wrong? He goes, I, I well, I have this, you know, he, he was getting beaten up and tortured. So he's like slept in a closet like <laughs> all weekend and all, and he didn't eat, shave, and he didn't bathe. And he says, My dear boy, why don't you try acting? You know, <laughs> famous well, you know, kind of story. You know, you know it. it Listen, I, I I feel everybody should find their own method. You you find your own method. You find you find, you your, own, you find your own method. You learn. You listen. Look, uh, you know when That's I'm key. I'm working with Duval, and I learned so much just watching him and trying. You know, I remember once he told me, and it, it stuck with me kind of. But he said, and do my fairly good Duval impression. Costanzo, acting is like life. We got more time than we think. And and I got what he meant. In other words, take take your breath and you know and savor the moment. And and it's your time. You're on camera. Don't rush it. And you know, uh, a lot to be said about that. However, you know, we all have our own motor too. We all have. I mean, I I think I work better. I, I remember uh, you know, Lovers and Other Strangers, which I've done a couple of times. A wonderful play to. They became good friends of mine, Renee Taylor and Joe Bologna. But when I first came out here uh, and I looked like a young Richard Castellano and everybody said, you're going to get the part. And I had a couple of callbacks with them and they were trying to get me to play Castellano, you know, who who was great in the role, but has a different motor than I do. I mean, he's much more, you know, a ponderous and slow. And, and that ain't me. I think you get, you know, you can get... You can get the guy, the, the character, a couple of different ways, you know. But uh, and I joked about that later on. They came to see me do the play once. And anyway, but Una, it's um, it's fast. We, you know, a journey. It is a journey, and you gotta, you know, if this is something that you want to pursue, that it is a journey. It's not a race. You know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go after it like you mean it, and never give up, and you know, have patience and persistence. And you know you got to be passionate about it, because this That's is not it. something that if you're not, then you shouldn't. You just you just stay home. That's <laughs> the thing. The three P's: patience, persistence, and passion. That's it. Let me ask you: if you would go back and give the little you, the younger you, some some advice, what would that be? Be a little more driven. Uh, do the things. You know, one of my great regrets is, and I think I could have really really been really strong in that area is to have done more of the classics done more i've done a good amount of theater and i'm proud of a lot of the work i did i recently did something a couple of years ago that in some ways it feels the best work i ever did it was called the alamo a wonderful play we did at john ruskin's theater but um i wish i had done more of that i wish i had really gone and really went after you know the williamstown festival and did the arena theater and really went after that uh, you know, I would occasionally, you know, sort of jerk myself off and send in a picture, but I never really followed it up. I really wish I had done more of that and, you know, done Chekhov, done Uncle Vanya, really have 
really had done that. That that was one thing. Um, I wish I did some more musical theater. I I, I can sing pretty well, and uh, you know I did Guys and Dolls, but I was more of an acting role. There's a couple of things I do have some regrets about those things, but uh, I just didn't have it's as not too much. Late. I wish I had more drive. I, I and people say you're full of shit. You're just begging for compliments because you did well. I go, I'm not. I'm on. I'm nothing else. I'm honest. I really do wish I had more drive, more ambition. I'm. I'm I, I was satisfied with things, and I wish I. I weren't. So that would be my advice: kick yourself in the ass and be all you can be. Don't just say, okay, I did okay, I made a living, bought a house, and really go, because I feel a little artistically frustrated in that respect. Yeah. That's great advice. Don't get comfortable. Yeah. Don't, don't get yeah, comfortable. Yeah, don't get comfortable. comfortable. Really, you know, really, really go after it. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I, I'm, I've always been, well, I don't know if that, that's a negative. I've always been kind of self-deprecating and all. You know, I have great belief in myself and ego, but Sometimes you put yourself down and it's not so smart because uh, people think, well, he doesn't have much of an opinion of himself. Why should I have an opinion of him? <laughs> yeah, be your best friend, not your worst enemy. Yeah you, yeah, you always think that everybody's kind of evolved and they get it. You know, like people say, hey, Costanzo's pretty bright. No shit. It took you 10 years to figure that out. Like, <laughs> and let me ask you. Going, going back to what we said originally, you got to be pretty bright, bright to play a moron, you know? <laughs> what's, what's the most fun you've had in Hollywood? Oh, geez. I had a lot of fun doing with friends like these. I got to play the lead with all these wonderful actors. That was fun. I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, I, I, got, uh, I had a lot of fun working with the great Duval on the light ship. You know, Bobby and I just bullshitting about everything thing about broads and life and wise guys and tough guys from the south and great food and you know just wonderful being Ann Bancroft's husband and fat so and you know having her yell at me like my aunt and 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 teasing her about the fact that she needed glycerin in her eyes to cry and then she said I hey, really didn't you bastard and she showed me what she worked on it was just a lot of great stuff that's why I'm going to put together a show Billy you should a one-man show. Make it happen. I, I, was playing, I was playing around with it. I should. I was you, want to re you want to rehearse it? I got a theater. Okay. I was going to say, maybe we'll do that. Let's wait. To, yeah, I was starting to do it at the actor's gym. You know, they had the theater, the White Fire, Bobby, sure. before the pandemic. And I was playing around with it there. I started out with the, Str the Strasburg story. And, you know, I realized all the anecdotal stuff that I have. The, uh, this is great. One, uh, my, my, one of my favorite stories is, we have time for it? One yes. Other yeah. One of my favorite stories is after we did The Light Ship, where I work with uh, guys who became really Arliss Howard, great actor in that. He was just starting out. Billy, William Forsythe. Uh, I love Billy. Even though the movie, yeah, Billy's nobody like him. And <clears throat> the uh, movie didn't turn out well at all. But Tom Bauer, my great friend. So we come back and I go, I tell my wife, that's it. I'm doing movies. I'm doing three of these a year. No television. I've had it. I can do movies now, right? So I'm home about two days. I get a call from Rochelle Fatherman, who was casting, uh, I think it was the $6 million man. And, you know, like Universal show. She goes, Robert, come in for this. And she called me at home. It was nice. And I said, well, I'd rather not. I'm going to try to stay with the movies, Rochelle, and if you don't mind. She goes, come in. You'll get the job. It's an annuity, the show's on. I go, all right. So I go there and uh, there's like 25 gorgeous blondes, me and who comes in, but he became a great friend and a great actor, Ron Perlman. Now, Ron had just come in from New York. He had the baby seat in the back. He and I bonded right away. We start talking about the Yankees and everything. And uh, we're up for like the two uh, guest shot mob guys, you know? So I'm waiting now a half hour. I'm waiting an hour. I'm threatening to leave a couple of times. Elsa, <laughs> stay here, stay here. I call this, and I'm going to put this in my show. The last time I really had balls in Hollywood. So here's what happens. This guy, Lou Shaw, comes in. He's the executive producer. He walks in an hour and a half late. Doesn't even say I'm sorry to us. Walks right into his inner office. We wait another 15 minutes. Rochelle knows that me, I'm like the star there's 25 bimbos Perlman who just showed up she's going Robert take it easy 
I walk in. He doesn't look up now, right? And I go, you you want to take a look at me or what? I said, and by the way, I, you're a little late. You want me to apologize for you? He looks up at me like, you can't believe I said this. She's loving it because the casting people, you know, these producers humiliate them. They love this shit. So finally I go, oh, Mr. Shore, sorry he's late, but he'll get to you. So now we sit down to read. And he goes, and this, I swear to God, I didn't make this up. He goes, should I know you? I go, well, unless you live under a rock in Walden Pond, I would hope so. So he goes, uh, 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 what, 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 what do you think of the script? Well, it ain't gone with the wind. And I ain't Gable, and you certainly ain't Selznick. I swear to God. <laughs> now, now we sit down to read, but he says uh, he's got the he's got the you know the Hollywood the loafers with no socks and the tassel. So I smack him on the loafer, and I go, "You really want me to read this shit or what?" He goes, "No, that's all right." And I got the card. Love it. Yeah, I, gotta tell, I gotta tell that story. And Perlman, Ron will Ron will verify that. I, I love that story. I, I yeah, call, yeah. yeah, so I'm gonna do stuff like that in my well, act, talk about working with people and uh who's your favorite actor that you work with? Oh, a good question. Wow. Hmm. Well, hmm. my favorite actor. You work with a lot. <laughs> yeah, I work with Duval. I, li I like Bobby a lot. Um, Have you worked with Bobby? Yeah, I did the light ship with Bob, you know. Yeah, oh, light ship. That's how he told me that story about you got more time than you think. Um, Bobby comes to mind. Uh, I like some of the young, some of the women who had, uh, like Valerie Harper was great when I did Rhoda. A couple of people. Um, David Strathairn, wonderful, great actor. Remember him? And uh, he got nominated for Best Actor. He he was with us and with friends like these. What a joy. We became really good friends. Beautiful, modest, humble, easy to work with. Great guy. Um, he comes to mind. Um, yeah, some of those guys. Who, who awesome. have, um, for me, that I've worked with? Like? Yeah. That I've worked with? Yeah. Well, well, you have Matthew Perry. No, I was, it was <laughs> probably talking Bobby De Niro. You know, we're talking. Oh, you, you work with De Niro. No, yeah. well, here's what happened: was I did, had done Pretty Woman with Gary Marshall, and uh, then Penny was doing Awakenings, and I got called in to read for a, 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 a cab driver, a Puerto Rican cab driver that picks him up when he's off the med meds and. He's, uh -huh. he's not, he's, you know, he's going back into his, you know, into that catatonic, you know, he's, 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 he's in bad shape. Right. So I had read and, and then I went to Palm Springs and then I got a call from my agent saying, Hey, they want to screen test you with Robert De Niro. It's going to be at, you know, Warner brothers on, uh, it was like Sunday or something like that. So I literally jumped in my car, raced home, raced came, uh, got ready for this thing. I walk into the room. There's Penny Marshall Laverne that I grew up with. Yeah, she produced Star with friends like these. Robert De Niro. Yeah. You know, now I'm thinking I'm looking for, you know, Raging Bull. I'm looking for a taxi driver. Yeah. I get Leonard from Awakenings. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, he's talking about method acting. I get this yeah, guy. Gotta, and he's you real you shy. Gotta, you gotta he's got nothing. Jacket. Yeah. So, but, but my scene is, you know, with him, uh, you know, I, he's sick and I'm telling him, come on, you're in a bad neighborhood. Let me get you out of here, whatever. And, and I'm trying to get him to get off this, you know, this bench and to get him in my cab. And, you know, I go to pick him up, you know, and he just lays there like dead weight and he makes me truly struggle to pick him wow. up. And in that moment, everything became so real in that moment. And we started improvising. And then I said, come on, then I'm going to get you home. And I threw him over my shoulder. I put him on my shoulder and I started carrying him as I'm improvising. And I got Robert De Niro on my shoulder and I'm walking at him. I'm waiting, you know, and finally Penny Marshall yells cut. And I, I put Robert De Niro down, you know, gently. And he goes, that was good. That was good. Yeah, that, did you get that? <laughs> so, no, they cut that part out. But oh. it did, they, they, they cut it out. Before oh, they, they, they never, filmed, they they never filmed, filmed it. it. But, but no. it didn't matter to me. Yeah. I floated, literally floated out of yeah, the room yeah, because, yeah. you know, Robert De Niro told yeah. me that was good, you know, and it was yeah, just... Yeah. I, I my my guy was always Pacino. Always wanted to work with Al. So the closest I came to that 
was I was doing Dick Tracy. And um, it was a great, that, that was a fun day in a way because Pacino was not working that day. And he was like in this great mood. And I, I, I was doing American Buffalo and, and Beatty, Beatty had seen me in a couple of things. And uh, I had to wait like uh, a month to get this, this one day of work, uh, you know, to be with Warren Bay. Nobody ever got to see the script. You know, it was uh, Vittorio Storato, the great Italian uh, cinematographer was there. So it was like this amazing day. Pacino, my acting idol, is watching the scene. So this was like a classic day. And Beatty is, Beatty's telling me shit like, hey, Costanzo, you're doing American Buffalo. Maybe me and Al will come to see you. And I'm going, oh, fuck, would that be? <laughs> I was doing, I was doing Donnie in America. I said, this would be. Yeah. Anyway, well, Pacino's watching the scene. And uh, Servino is my boss. And he's got these big lips. So I come over and and um, this is fucking hilarious. What's his name? Uh, uh, Beatty tells Storato. Uh, uh, well, you know what? Was? Storato sort of was like his own director. He like he deferred to him in terms of the lighting and all that. And he had his young nephew there, Fausto. So we're rehearsing. So he goes, "Whenever you're ready," and then we go and. And all of a sudden, Beatty goes, so Robert, he tells you, you go around and you go to lips and yada, yada, you do a little improv and then do the lines of the script, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, so, so I go over to him and, uh, and, and we're ready to do the scene. And so there's me, Servino, Jack Keogh, who's like an old Irish character actor, and Madonna, who Beatty was with at the time, actually. Yeah. And uh, he goes... So Servino, Paul goes, who might, and she was breathless in the script, who might breathless be? And she goes, who the fuck do you think? This is before we rehearsed. Everybody kind of suppresses a laugh because Paul can, Paul can get a little bombastic to say the least. So we start the scene and when we come around, oh, and then uh, your baby says, uh, so you'll come here, Robert, and then Vittorio will, will take breathless off the stage and we'll include her and we'll do the master but. And he said, who went breathless be? And we all laughed, Pacino's watching and everything. So now when we do the rehearsal for the scene, he smacks me hard in the face, Servino. And we know each other. And I looked at him and I was gonna clock him. But I let it go. I know what he did. He did that, he transferred his shit onto me from her. So we talk, ladies, Bobby, I'm sorry. I said, all right, Paul, let that go. <laughs> I've always wanted to tell Pacino about that, like that, what happened. So now cut to John Cappadici and I go see Al do Salome. And, and John knew, knew Pacino because he had done uh, uh, American Buffalo uh, with him. He, went, he was understudying J.J. Johnson. They went to London and all. Wow. We went backstage and I finally got to tell uh, Pacino that story. He laughed, you know, but it was... It's crazy shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to work with uh, Pacino. Though. Yeah, me too. I, I got to meet him backstage when he was doing the yeah, Tennessee I met him Williams. A of yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I noticed that you had your, your first acting credit was Dog Day Afternoon. Is that, what, what's up with that? That's not my, uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, who was that my first acting credit? I was an extra in that. Well, a lot of us were extras in that. Uh, and, you, were you out there on the street? During I that was out time? there on the street. Yeah, I, that, that was not a speaking part, right? But I was. A, you know what's funny about that? They did a, a like an anthology of great films of the '70s, and uh, I'm not in the. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a a, 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 a a principal in that. I I'm not supposed to. Get, I never got residuals. I was. I was. You know, an extra. Yeah. Some money. We all became. A lot of us became friends. We were young actors. You know, out here in Hollywood, a lot of them are doctors and nurses and. But we all wanted to be actors in New York, and we were all on that movie. And they called me and asked me if I could, if they could use my. There's a close-up of me in that, and they paid me like 800 bucks for it. I was like, yeah, dog day afternoon. What, was, a, what what a great experience that must have been as a young actor to watch, you know, Al you know, Pacino you know, going you know, Attica, Attica. You know? And I, you know, what I remember a couple of things about that Charlie Durning. Yes, I got I got a part in a. Talk about playing different characters. Burt Reynolds directed a thing called uh, The Last Producer. And I and I got a nice offer to play an Armenian real estate guy. And uh, Lauren Holly was my hot girlfriend. I never got these kind of parts. So I, I, I asked Charlie Durning, I said, 
you have anything to do with that, Charlie? And he goes, what do you think? You know, <laughs> close with Bert. And I got this off because Dernie must have said, offer this to this guy, Robert Costanza. So that's, that was great. But uh, I, Derning, I got to know through Doug and John Casale, the great. Wow, Cassell, yeah, the great Casale. Who was the guy yeah. after three movies. So yeah, I'm, right I'm on the train going, going home after work one day. And he and I said, Mr. Casal. He goes, Yeah, hi. And I said, I'm on the movie. I'm oh, so warm talking to me about acting. And yeah, such a know, talent. Him were like, they were like brothers. He, yeah, you know, part of him. He never, never got over John's death. You know. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I was, listen. I, I got to tell yeah. you, I am so honored to have you on this show. You know, imparting your wisdom, your knowledge. You know, I, 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 I you know, I'm a big fan of your work. I look forward to seeing you you know you got to put that play together i i, I want to see it i want to come watch you on stage doing that i think you're such a talented actor i think you're a hell of a guy and i'm i'm truly blessed to have you on the show so i want to well, thank you from the bottom of my heart billy thank you man i've always i'm glad we reconnected again and uh, we'll stay in touch more yeah more. absolutely it's What's, so great to see you you're you know i don't know if the people out there know how talented you are i'm sure they've seen you in things you're you're something else, and uh, this is great. You're doing all this now, and you're you know moving actors and people, talented people, on their careers. It's great. It's good to do this. Thanks a lot, my friend. Thank you, Bobby. Take care. Thanks, God brother. bless. And listen, you, you know, once this thing calms down and you know the pandemic's over, I want you to come into the theater. You know, I will. I come will hang out. All right. Take okay, care, buddy. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Please rate, review, share this with your friends. Subscribe if you haven't. Please take whatever you get from here, the golden nuggets, and apply them to your career. Go after your dreams with passion. Don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. I believe in you. Follow your dreams. I'll see you in Hollywood.